Welcome and don't worry, you will see my talking head for less than half a minute. My name is Dr. Kevin Bucknall and this video is based on a book and an article that I wrote. You can download this article along with 11 others all free. About half of them will explain how you can improve your study methods. I'll tell you where to get them all at the end of this video. Let's get going. The four main points I want to talk about today are in front of you now. If you want to remember these four main points, we could shorten them to nationalism, conformity, class and industrialization. First, the consciousness of being Japanese is part of a powerful nationalism. Dr. Johnson, he's the one who put together the first dictionary in England way back in the 18th century, said in 1775 that patriotism is the last refuge of the scoundrel. Not everyone in the world would agree with him, and I believe that most Japanese would not. They love their country, its heritage and its culture, including its geishas, samurai and martial arts. Before I say more, I should apologize for my poor Japanese accent. Geishas are not prostitutes but entertainers, although an overlap of function might sometimes occur. They were skilled in the arts, including music and dance. Samurai, these are warriors with a strict code of honorable conduct called Bushido. They enjoyed huge privileges, at some times this included the right to chop off the head of mere commoners if the latter offended them in any way. Sometimes it did not take much. Samurai were not themselves nobles, but served as defenders of and fighters for a feudal lord. Honour and loyalty were their watchwords. Today those descended from old samurai families are well respected and esteemed in society. Martial Arts there are thousands of different schools, but certain broad groupings exist, such as kendo, using swords. Karate, an aggressive attacking form. Jiu-jitsu, more defensive. Aikido, again defensive. And Kaiudo, using bows and arrows. Then there's the sumo wrestlers, big, fat, heavy and strong. In the West, we hear a lot about fighting obesity. Well, in an odd sort of way, that describes them quite accurately. Superficially, Japan adopts foreign ideas and words easily. Here's a short list of some of them. Many are common everyday words, and some are interesting. But adopting foreign ideas and words seems to make little impact on the basic Japanese-ness of the country. Japan cut itself off from the world for centuries. It was willing to adopt some foreign ideas, such as Buddhism, which it grafted onto the existing Shinto religion, and the Chinese tea ceremony, which then became the very formal Japanese tea ceremony. But Japan deliberately kept out foreigners as much as possible, and people could even be put to death for adopting foreign ideas or ways. Japan was forcibly opened up by the American Commodore Matthew Perry, who came with his black ships in the period 1853 to 54. Why were they called black ships? They were old, dark in colour and billowed out black smoke. The Japanese had never seen steamships before and were impressed by them generally, and by their guns in particular. Here is his photograph again, and a Japanese likeness. What do you think? His mother might not agree, but I rather prefer the Japanese version. Until Perry arrived, the country was feudal, under the control, sometimes looser than he would have liked, of the Shogun. He was the person who ran the country in the name of the Emperor, who was totally sidelined and powerless. Below the Shogun were the Daimyo, these were feudal lords who ran vast estates or areas and had real power. The danger of them plotting to overthrow the shogun was often present. 
Some lords looked more powerful and handsome than others. Although the first two shown were real, the third is merely a film star. This feudal system came to an end with the arrival of Perry. The young emperor, only 16 years old, was placed in power in 1868. Outside of Tokyo and a few main cities, there are relatively few resident foreigners. Over 98% of the country are Japanese, and more than half the rest are either Korean or Chinese. Not a lot of foreigners can tell the difference, as they sometimes superficially look Japanese, at least to the casual eye of the inexperienced Occidental tourist. If they are really traditional, or maybe dressed up for some special event, the hat they wear might be a bit of a clue. Second main point. The desire to conform is strongly built into the national psyche. Harmony in group relations is heavily prized. Obviously, in the case of a submarine crew, each individual's survival depends greatly on the others, but the principle of group solidarity applies everywhere in Japan. Harmony matters. If you are foreign and living in Japan and make a cultural gaffe, it is likely that no one will tell you. It would destroy the harmony between you, so it is perfectly possible to offend people for years and never know. Japanese people are mostly kind and will neither tell you nor hold it against you. You are, after all, a foreigner. But they might not invite you out much to restaurants or round to their place if they fear you could embarrass them or their friends in some way. The author Ian Fleming had his hero James Bond reprimanded for blowing his nose into a handkerchief in public while in Japan. It just is not done, especially when eating at the table. On the other hand, loud sniffing is quite acceptable, the reverse of many Western societies. When you make friends in Japan, it is important to work on group bonding. For example, when a host orders a particular drink, say whiskey, it is polite if you then order the same drink. There is a sort of hidden flattery of his good choice in this, and it strengthens the feeling of the group. It is widely held that it is dangerous for an individual to distance himself or herself from the group. One should do what the others are doing and not buck the trend and stand out. There is a well-known folk saying that it is the nail that stands up that always gets hammered down. Good manners and proper behaviour are clearly prescribed for all. It is a formal and somewhat ceremonial culture. The effort constantly to be polite and behave properly in order to keep harmony results in a lot of hidden worry and anxiety. In organisations or social groups there are often strong suspicions and undercurrents while rumours circulate behind the scenes. Personal stress levels can be high. Changes in society are often gradual and for this reason are hard to date accurately but it would seem that stress levels in Japan have increased since the last decade of the 20th century for several reasons. A long-running recession began in the early 1990s and it still continues. Unemployment increased and workers began to worry about keeping their jobs. In large corporations the practice of lifelong employment began to wither away and companies will now dismiss workers, adding to their uncertainty. Modern ways of running firms have begun to be introduced, bringing in new rules that people do not like or sometimes even understand. In the international arena, the rapid development of China, which eventually pushed Japan out of second place as the world's richest country, worries people, some of whom feel a bit ashamed about it. Then North Korea, with its unpredictable leadership and development of long-range nuclear missiles, poses a constant threat in the minds of some. So workers and people generally face a much more stressful future. In Japan the word salaryman describes anyone, often working for a large corporation, who earns a salary, loosely any white-collar businessman. They are often tired in the evening, particularly if they've been out drinking with their boss and colleagues, which is a common event. There are constant stories, and even movies such as Tokyo Sonata, of salarymen being fired and still leaving the house each day in office dress 
pretending that they continue to have a job to go to. The shame of being dismissed is not easy to live with, for, just as in China, shame is taken very seriously in the culture, much more so than in many Western societies. In Japan, people even commit suicide if they feel shame strongly enough, and the country has one of the highest suicide rates in the developed world. Maybe the high stress level is why Japanese adult males often enjoy reading thick manga comics, some of which feature a hero totally unconstrained by any social mores and may contain sex, sadism and violence. How the women cope with the increased stress levels is less clear. Maybe they're just stronger than us men. Unlike in some Western societies, they cannot normally pop round to a neighbour for a nice cup of tea and reassurance, as such behaviour is not a common part of the culture, although tea drinking is. Third main point, there is no strong class system in Japan. Japan moved so rapidly from a feudal society with a rural base and feudal lords running things to a modern urban industrial society that it avoided the gradual build-up of a large working class with an awareness of its identity and bound by feelings of antagonism towards the ruling classes in theoretical Marxist fashion. Consequently, there are few feelings of the us versus them kind, and trade unions are not bodies with a central function of being antagonistic towards management. Fourth and final point, Japan takes the lead in the process of industrialization in Asia. By Asian standards, Japan began to industrialize early. Shortly after 1868, the new Meiji government promoted it strongly. The country actively sought foreign ideas and especially foreign technology. The Scottish-born merchant Thomas Glover helped overthrow the shogunate and later set up a company that subsequently became Mitsubishi. Improved transport was part of this development process. Walking and riding were the early common methods of getting about and the rickshaw is well known abroad. The poster shows people walking, cycling, a rickshaw, horse-drawn vehicles and even an early train. Before long, Japan was turning out such products as steel, textiles, ships and motor vehicles. It is fair to say that Japan jumped from the Middle Ages to the 20th century in only one generation, a truly remarkable feat, without going through the more normal, slow and tedious process. Here we have a fascinating shot of a traditional samurai in 1866 and how he looked one year later in 1867. Enough for now. As I promised earlier, here is where you can download the 12 free articles and the free book from Kerway Press. You might want to get ready to pause the video to take note of the information about to come, but only if you are interested, of course. You can download the free article, The Most Important Elements in Japanese Culture, part of which was used to make this video. If you want to learn more about Japan, you could check out a book I wrote, Japan, Doing Business in a Unique Culture. This is available in paperback and also as an e-book and published by Boson Books. You can read a sample by going to their site. Back to Careway Press. You can also download six free articles, most of which explain how you can improve your study methods. Then there are five free articles with an economic slant. And there is a free book, An Introduction to Economics. My latest book is Going to University, The Secrets of Success. This can help you study better get to university and settle down there quickly and easily. It is available from Amazon. And now for some acknowledgements.